course of my 38 years, I've been asked hundreds of times, what are you? My answer has always been the same. I'm biracial, I'm half black, half white. Of those hundreds of times, there have only been a few when my response has been met with resistance. And each time it was, the reason the person gave for them not wanting me to identify as I do, as I am, has been, yeah, but that's not how society sees you. I can't speak for society, but speaking from my own experience, I can tell you that embracing my biraciality has enabled me to live authentically, and that the facts of my life offer a powerful argument for why more people who hold seemingly dichotomous identities should be given the space to embrace all of who they are. So even though you haven't asked me, what are you? I'd like to share why I've always said and will always say, I'm half black and half white. I'm biracial. My mother, Sunny, is a white woman. She wasn't pregnant when she got, uh, she wasn't married when she got pregnant with me and she couldn't have cared less that that was frowned on by society. It was through her example that I learned that it's better to choose love than to have our choices dictated by the opinions of others. My dad, Daryl, is a black man. Since my parents split up before I was born, he was never in my life. Yet I inherited most of my physical features and the first part of my name, Daryllise, from him. Although Daryl wasn't in the picture, I had not one but two stand-in father figures whose enduring and ongoing presences helped shape how I see the world and myself. The first was my mother's father, who I referred to as GP, short for grandpa. GP had 10 children and eventually 23 grandchildren, and I was hands down his favorite. I should tell you that he was white. My second father figure was my mom's boyfriend, Rodney. My earliest memory is of being carried on his shoulders when I was three. I called him SD, short for stepdad. He called me baby girl. Baby girl, he'd say with a smile, you might not be my blood, but you're my daughter. And when he died a few years ago, I was listed as his daughter in his obituary. What I haven't yet told you is that Rodney was black. Throughout my life, I formed genuine and lasting relationships with black, white, and biracial people. Relationships that arose as a direct result of my capacity to occupy a spectrum of spaces as a black, white, biracial person. For instance, my white mother became involved with Black Books Galore, a nonprofit organization that showcased children's literature with black and brown characters created by black authors and illustrators. And I partially attribute that early representation to my lifelong love of literature. In fact, so much of who I am today is a result of being shaped by black, white, and biracial influences and affiliations that I wouldn't have had without being both black and white, being biracial. Like visiting my white aunts, uncles, and cousins in Cape Cod, or spending time with Rodney and his relatives, or becoming an honorary family member to an affluent black family who embraced me as a third daughter and surrogate sister. Speaking of surrogate siblings, from the time I was three until I was 11, Mom and her white best friend, Bonnie, and Bonnie's black husband, Donnie, yes, their names rhymed, were inseparable, which meant that my primary playmates were Bonnie and Donnie's black, white, biracial kids. 30 years ago, when I was eight years old, Mom, Bonnie, and Donnie joined an interracial parents and children's group that was comprised of eight interracial couples and their multiracial kids. The purpose of the group was to see ourselves reflected in others and to spend time with other multiracial families. 
at one of our monthly get-togethers, the coordinators brought in experts, I guess they were experts, to talk to us about race. Parents went to one room, kids went to another. So we could feel free to share without parental scrutiny. And our parents could feel free to worry aloud about the inevitable challenges their biracial children would face because of our split racial identities. I should tell you that I've never felt challenged or split by my racial identity. And I don't believe it is the destiny of all biracial people to face racial identity challenges. Sure, some of us face them. And some of us, like me, who are afforded the internal and external safety to be ourselves, don't. Anyway, one of the first questions the expert responsible for educating our group about our racial identities asked us was, which race are you? Then she went around the room and took a poll. Black, the first child answered. Black, the second one said. Black, came the third. All the other 11 kids, including Bonnie and Donnie's, had the same response. I was confused by this, considering that each of them had one black parent and one white parent who were, at that very moment, just a room away. But I waited until it was my turn, and I answered, I'm half black and half white. I'm biracial. The facilitator seemed taken aback. But how do you identify? It was my turn to be taken aback. I'm biracial, I repeated. I'm half black, half white. But which one? I looked her straight in her kind brown eyes and said, I'm not one. I'm two things at the same time in the same person. She thought for a moment, then informed me that that's not how society sees me. I told her I didn't care how society sees me. I knew who I was, who I am. I feel incredibly blessed to have been taught to embrace the fullness of my racial identity. And even more broadly, to have been taught not to define myself based on other people's assessments, which when it comes to black, white, biracial people in America, have been erratic and ever-changing. Let's look at the history. In 1850, someone with my exact same ethnic ancestry would have been recorded on the US Census as mulatto. In 1890, in addition to mulatto, the census added the categories quadroon and octoroon to describe those whose parentage rendered them a quarter or an eighth black, respectively. Those sort of fractional categorizations of people are antiquated and offensive. Yet at the same time, they point to the reality that black and white weren't always constructed as binaries with nothing in between. In fact, it wasn't until the early 1900s that the one drop rule was culturally and legally codified into American society. If you're not familiar with the one drop rule, it was an arbitrary designation that held that if a person had a single drop of quote unquote black blood, they would be considered all black to the exclusion of their white heritage. The institution of the rule came about in an effort to enforce segregation and to strip people of color of power and privilege. And roughly 100 years later, the one drop rule is no longer a legal designation, but it remains a societal construction designed to maintain the stark divide between you white people and us black people, or you black people and us white people. But I'm both. And I love the unique spectrum space that I occupy. I love Sonny and Daryl and GP and Rodney and Bonnie and Donnie and the black and white and biracial children I grew up with, all of whom were like stand-in siblings until the birth of my biological sister, Tyla, a few months after my 12th birthday. Tyla would be black too, according to the one drop rule, mulatto in 1850s terms and a quadroon according to 1890s standards. Although we're technically half siblings, we're wholly connected in love. And like me, she identifies as biracial. I'm not saying every multiracial person needs to identify the way I do. 
What I'm saying is that we shouldn't define ourselves based on the constructions and conventions of the same society that slaughtered millions of people while invading then colonizing their land, stole human beings from across the ocean, then sold them into slavery, subjected them to rape, and murdered those who attempted to run away. A society that locks children in cages and incarcerates people based on the color of their skin. As the individuals who comprise society, we have a responsibility to move beyond narrow constructions and conceptions, and to embrace people not for who we tell them they have to be, but for who they tell us they are. In my work as a journalist and a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist, I've had the honor of interviewing many individuals who share my same racial makeup. Most of them I've spoken with haven't grown up claiming both sides of themselves as I have. Yet most of them have also told me about having experiences that are unique to their biracial identity. For example, having the disastrous and hilarious experience of a white mother trying to do their multi-ethnic hair. <laughs> or being aware that their complexion somehow granted them access to what several people have described to me as both the black world and the white world. Because of the unique non-binary space that we occupy, many of us biracial people have had experiences that can't be adequately understood if we pick sides along the racial divide. Yet more often than not, that's what we're expected to do. In the United States, black, white, biracial adults are three times more likely to personally identify as black than as white. And 61% say they are perceived by others to be black and not multi-ethnic or biracial. Statistics that make infinite sense given America's systemic racism and the lingering impact of the one drop rule. But definitions don't sync up with lived experiences. Several studies suggest that those of mixed race identity are at risk for greater feelings of alienation and possible risky behavior than our monoracial counterparts, white or black. At the same time, there's also evidence that demonstrates that many biracial Americans experience increased social capital. According to one Pew Research survey, a mere 4% of biracial people view their race as a liability, while 76% say their race has made no difference, and 19% of us report feeling that our biraciality has been an asset. You may be wondering, which is it? Does biraciality lead to positive, negative, or neutral outcomes? What if it's all and none? What if in and of itself being biracial doesn't lead to any particular outcome? And instead, each biracial person's understanding of race and how they fit within the spectrum of race has less to do with race itself than with their perceptions and experiences. We live in a society where celebrities like Halle Berry, Colin Kaepernick, and Alicia Keys have undeniable impact and influence. A society that twice elected Barack Obama. At the same time, it's also a society where a person of mixed race heritage can be shot, killed, and harmed based on other people's perceptions. A society where every day those who check multiple boxes are asked to pick one and only one. When any person is forced to deny their truth, whether by society, culture, or family, there are negative ramifications. For example, when we look at gender identity, all the evidence conclusively demonstrates that the damage people suffer due to their non-binary identity is caused not by the identity itself, but by suppression and repression. And while we still have a long, long way to go, the expanded cultural consciousness around the spectrum of gender identity has helped people to realize that individuals don't need to change who they are. Society needs to wake up 
and embrace them as they are. Much as defining gender in solely binary terms has been perpetuating genderism, defining race in solely binary terms is part of a system of identity denial and suppression that is keeping racism alive within the United States. That doesn't mean ignoring or denying history. I recognize that had I been born in a different time or a different geographical location, my white ancestors likely would have rejected me or even enslaved me. I know too that my black ancestors could have enveloped me into their fold as an equal and active family member. Or alternatively, they could have referred to me as a tragic mulatto and ostracized me because of my light skin and obvious ties to their oppressors. Those attitudes are still all too prevalent. I've listened to heartbreaking personal stories about multiracial people being called the N-word, being left out of their white relatives' family gatherings, or being rejected as not black enough by black friends or family. I feel incredibly fortunate to have had enough lifelong support and safety that I've been able to unapologetically embrace all of my racial identity and to cherish the experience of existing in the spectrum between black and white. What's more, if I were to pick a side, black or white, to the exclusion of the other, what would that mean for all the times my white mother tucked me in at night after reading me bedtime stories with affirming brown skin characters? Or the times my black stand-in father took me out for ice cream or schooled me in Uno? Wouldn't I be erasing my life experiences? I am a biracial person whose life has been enriched by my white, black, and biracial family and surrogate families. And I don't want people like me to continue to be pressured into binary categories or to have their identities superimposed onto them instead of being granted the freedom to own and acknowledge their truth. Racism occurs when ignorance is weaponized and when people and systems dehumanize and devalue others. So shouldn't we lean into truth, into love? If as a cultural collective we hope to build racial resilience, we have to support more expansive and inclusive understandings of race. And if we care about the individuals that comprise society, we have to support people in owning and embracing all aspects of themselves. Loving my blackness and whiteness at the same time has helped me to understand that there's something beyond separation, division, hate, and fragmentation. Something beyond the pain of the past. And my conception of an ideal society is one in which people can be all of who they are. So if you're biracial, the next time someone asks you, how do you identify? I hope you'll say whatever aligns with your sense of yourself, not what you've been conditioned to think you have to believe or conditioned to think you have to say in spite of who you know yourself to be. And if you're not biracial, when a person who is tells you they are, please don't ask them to pick a side because there are no sides when you exist within a spectrum. Thank you.